Buenos dias, bonjour, sin chao, ni hao. What's up? It's me, Mr. Jordan. Today we're going to be looking at Margaret Atwood, The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, it's a classic book. It's kind of a dystopian, futuristic, America has gone to hell in a handbasket. Read in almost every university in North America, certainly across English lit classes all around the world. It's like all of Atwood's books, full of wordplay and pun and double entendre, all kinds of really deep metaphorical uh, allusions, references, a lot of biblical stuff. Anyhow, without further ado, let's jump into the text. Literal brief recap of chapter one. There's a group of women who are trapped in the gymnasium. There's a disaster or emergency, and they've had to leave their homes. They're sleeping in cots in the gymnasium where they're being guarded by another set of women who they refer to as aunts. And these aunts are carrying electric cattle prods, so they're threatening them with violence. And outside of the gymnasium building, there's a fence, a chain link fence, that's guarded on the inside by guards and on the outside by angels. And these angels facing outward are protecting this area, whether it's a, a prison or a hospital or whatever it is, a shelter where the women and the narrators are being kept, the angels are a second layer of security. Let's jump into the text and do a close line by line reading of chapter one. At the top, we can see Atwood starts with we. So we don't know who this narrator is, but she's speaking of a collective, like a plural, rather than the I or the second person, you. It's not I, it's not you, it's we. So there's a group of them. We slept in what had once been the gymnasium. The floor was of varnished wood with stripes and circles painted on it for the games that were formerly played there. The hoops for the basketball nets were still in place, though the nets were gone. A balcony ran around the room for spectators. I thought I could smell faintly, like an afterimage, the pungent scent of sweat, shot through with the sweet taint of chewing gum and perfume from the watching girls, felt skirted as I knew from the pictures, later in miniskirts, then pants, then in one earring, spiky green streaked hair. So you're getting this image here of nostalgia, of the narrator looking back, we yearned for the future. And then like a good poet, she rhymes, yearn, learn. How do we learn it? The talent for insatiability. It was in the air. And it was still in the air, an afterthought. So here she references the earlier after image with afterthought, building up on that idea of repetition. And, and really, that she's a, she's a poet. She loves wordplay. So they could smell an after image. So what's an after image? An after image is the trace. When you stare at, at something bright and it leaves the faint outline, outline on your eyes, um, or if you stare at something that's pink and then you look away and you see green, that after image is the trace left on your retina. She's talking about a smell, something that's redolent, how a smell recalls memory. It's recalling images to her. And then she runs down this list of images that is really almost a, a history of, of the women's rights movement. So first the women have felt skirts, then they go to mini skirts, then they move on to pants. Then they're just wearing one earring and eventually they have spiky green streaked hair. So you see how she really tracks through decades of history in a single sentence, an afterthought is giving us another division. There's the before and then the after. And the narrator is living in a world that's after, much like a before Christ and after Christ. There's been this drastic turning point in history. And the present tense of the novel, the now that the narrator is speaking to us through, is after horror normal life, her regular world, right? And in essence, it's after America. America is gone. Whatever has happened has ended America as we know it. And they've moved on to this future world, this after image, this afterthought. It gives us this word, which we'll include in the vocabulary after the chapter, a palimpsest. 
So what is a palimpsest? A palimpsest is the layers. Almost like imagine if you're in a bathroom stall and you're seeing the gra graffiti that's been scratched layer after layer or written layer after layer, or you're walking outside and you see a wall and there's, there's spray paint upon spray paint upon spray paint, um, or a wall of posters where you get the layers of layers of posters built up and then the weather slowly eats away at them and you can see one text occupying the space above another text and another. That's a palimpsest. In other words, it's the same thing that Atwood's done in the first uh, in the first sentence there, in that first description. So she's building up these images of different girls from different eras, and really telling us the history of the 20th century. In this first chapter, Atwood's setting up a lot of the main themes that are going to fall in the book. Power and control, who has it, who doesn't. The narrator, who's nameless, is powerless. She's had everything taken from her, her life, her name. So a few vocabulary words from chapter one. Um, so will be the definition and the context of the word. So yearning means to have an intense feeling of longing or desire for something. Uh, typically it's something that's been taken away or lost, separated from. Uh, so our narrator has much that she's lost, much that she's been separated from. And we'll find out through a series of flashbacks all of the things that she yearns for. Uh, in this first chapter, mostly she's yearning for, for bodily desire, for contact or touch with another human. Pungent, in this sense, is a very strong or sharp and intense smell, something that's pungent, like a stinky cheese, um, but can also come from this idea of something that's caustic or biting. So from Latin, uh, Awood's a real wordsmith and she knows Latin, and so it means to prick or to poke something. Like almost obsessed is like when there's writing or words and they've been rubbed out, they've literally been taken off the surface. And then another layer of writing has happened over top. So like graffiti on a wall, you know, the old Berlin wall that had graffiti on it and then it was sandblasted and then there's more graffiti and more graffiti. And it builds up these layers. It's also an obvious metaphor here for history and the layers of history rewriting themselves and Atwood's going to tell the story of a culture that's rewritten itself, right? So America has been rewritten from the current America in 1980s where she was writing to this new America with a, a less freedom, with less power to choose in the individual and more power in the central state in a totalitarian government um, run by Christian fundamentalists. And so this idea of palimpsest and that word palimpsest is really all right, that's it for today. Adios, cuídate, hasta luego, bon voyage, bon nuit, buenas noches, take care. Uh, I'll see you in the next video where we do an analysis, close reading, and look at some of the vocabulary in Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, chapter two. Well, I was unplanned, but good timing, hey? Looks like class is out. Take care.